Welcome to another Manx Grand Prix tech piece. We're going to get under the skin of another one of the race bikes today. I've chosen to do the intro here in Parc Ferme. I reckon it's a non-race day. Where I'm stood is just about the quietest part of the whole paddock. Usually this is packed. Usually there's loads of noise going on. And without a doubt, the loudest bike this year for me has been that Norton. We're going to go and speak to Richard Wilson. It's a family run team. It's an incredible bike. I don't know all that much about it. I'm looking forward to learning. I hope you enjoy the show. So certainly one of the most popular bikes in the paddock at the Manx Grand Prix is the Wiz Norton Rotary. Very nice. It uh, draws a crowd when it's running because it makes an amazing sound. But here in the paddock, I think it draws a crowd because there's usually bits of it in a tray next to the hat where you're collecting cash for yeah, repairs. Little collection box, yeah. Well, let, let's start with a little bit of team history before we get into the bike. What's the background? Um, my dad has always been into rotaries full stop. So he used to have um, an old police bike, Norton, that he used to ride to work and then bought a, uh, a project off someone to build a road Norton Rotary, um, an F1, and the guy got halfway through that and then gave up and started building his own Spitfire. So my dad wow. bought all the bits and then made that into a bit of a race bike and he did the um, Ulster Grand Prix on that in 2001. Yeah. Um, and then a friend raced it at the Newcomers uh, Manx in 2010. Um, and then it kind of like everyone bike racing it just escalates out of control over the years and each year it goes a bit gets a bit bigger and a bit more expensive and ended up there's a, um, a guy called Tony Carey raced these bikes in Ireland in the sort of mid 90s and then we got the well my dad got the bikes from um, a guy in uh, Wrexham yeah. um, and we just kind of built up from there really um, and then I suppose <clears throat> we kind of peaked in terms of star rider in 2017 and 18 josh brooks rode the other bike yeah um, so i only ever had one teammate and he was pretty good and it was josh brooks <laughs> yeah that's all right isn't it I do, where do we where do we start with a bike like this there's a reason why i said earlier that i just didn't want to research this and just come into it blind i kind of know a little bit but obviously there probably isn't enough time for me to gen up on it enough so i just thought i'd come in and you could fill in all of yeah. the gaps i think i'm looking at a is that a Spondon yeah. chassis? Yeah, Spondon, yeah. So, but, so let's start let's let's start like we have with the other bikes at the front and, yeah. and work our way to the madness in the middle. Yeah, so it's been yeah, it's been a long sort of steady progress from having, you know, we, we got to a stage after the first year with Josh of trying to get both bikes the same so that everything was interchangeable. Mm -hmm. So a lot of work um, sort of with Chris Ambler, who's a, a guy in Cumbria, a really talented fellow that um, makes all the bracketry and the tanks and everything so we got both bikes matching so that in theory all the parts will just swap from one yeah, to the other yeah yeah um, so we've got a, it's an again various iterations there's been different dashes and ecus and things we've got an mbe ignition now which is a really good bit of kit and so then, where have you taken these forks from these are white power forks that yeah. um were kind of period from the day they came with the bikes the dash here tells us what the water and the air temperature are doing. So there's the water temperature is the same as any other bike, yep. um, water-cooled bike. And then the air temperature, there's a sensor um, in this middle bit um, that tells us what air temperature the bike is running at. And so we'll come to that in terms of how the engine's cooled and everything. Yeah. Um, but the, the key thing there is, is getting the air in through these grey pipes, mm -hmm. through the centre of the engine to cool the bearing out of the centre of the engine through this big hose pipe where the air temperature sensor is and out through the exhaust. So there's a little nozzle in the exhaust pipe that creates a vacuum that sucks air. Oh, like a Venturi. Exactly, yeah. 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 Um, that sucks air through the scoops in the fairing, through these grey pipes, yeah. through the centre and out and that gets mixed with a bit of oil uh, and that's why it, it sort of sparks and flames a bit on the down changes and stuff. So it pisses off everyone who sits behind you. <laughs> Apart from me. Right, let's get into it. I know you've got a cutaway motor over there and we'll we'll yeah. we'll run a, a shot of that while we're talking. Yeah. But in, in Fisher Price question terms, if I said what is a rotary, just in case there are people watching that completely have no idea whatsoever mm. yeah. what a rotary motor looks like and why it works like it does. So a conventional engine, whether it's a two stroke or four stroke, it's got a crank, a conrod and a piston that goes up and down. Um this is 
simply a roughly a figure of eight chamber, a triangular shaped rotor. So every time the rotor does a complete turn, you've got an intake, a combustion and an exhaust three times. So the capacity is relatively small compared to a, um, a conventional piston mm. engine, but you're getting three bangs for your buck sort of thing. Um, it's, it's, you're getting three sparks for every time, uh, three ignitions um, for every rotation of the piston. So what is rotor. the, so this is, the capacity of this is 588 yeah. cc? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the, like, there's a list of questions that people keep asking and it's like, what wears out on them? How do you get bits? Tips and what, all yeah, the stuff. Tips and all yeah. that stuff, yeah. Because um, they've all, I think, read the same article from yeah. 1980 something. Yep. Um, so the yeah the capacity is really, it's just it's a capacity it's it's what the volume of the engine is yep. but the confusion comes because back in the sort of 90s when they were when the black JPS bikes were cleaning up at British Superbike yeah, yeah. at the time um, they were just destroying four stroke 750s of the day um, so they just added capacity to it arbitrarily to mm -hmm. make it. Um, an oversized engine effectively. Yeah. They just multiplied the capacity by a certain figure to make it above a thousand just to just to um, get it out of the class. Yeah. Yeah. So if it's five eight eight CC, which people, you know, sports bike fans will have a picture yeah. in their head of like a CBR six hundred or something now. Yeah. Uh, how much how much does it weigh and how much power does it make? Uh, it's about 130 kilos. Um, Which is way down. That's a, that sounds yeah. like a really light bike. Yeah, it is. Um, it's like um, a powerful 250, yeah. I think, to ride. Um, but it's um, about 120, 130 horsepower. Yeah. Um, but compared to like the XR69s and the ZXR 750s, 750, 750 plus. Yeah. Um, with about the same in the speed trap. So like the top top riders will, I know they'll be going through quarry bends faster than me. Yeah. But I'm kind of relatively higher up in the speed traps than. Yeah, I think Big Brian McCormack was 172 through yeah. there on one of the first or second day. Yeah. So he, I know he'll be going faster than me through quarry bends. Um, but top speed on this is 167. I got a toe off. There's Lee Johnson. Yeah. Uh, Michael Sweeney and Paul Jordan, I think there was three of them, and I got a real like tow along Sulby, and that was pretty much the fastest we've ever done through there. So. Yeah. So it's twin rotor, so they've got the obviously the, the twin carb set up, manifold in, um, and we've always run a flat slide um, carburetor, which we think, and this is a lot of trial and error, they were always like ultimate performance. They were they had a bit more potential. Yeah. But the these CV cards which we've changed to are potentially a little bit lower performance, but less sensitive to any sort of changes in the atmospheric pressure, yeah. like a two, you know, like a two fifty. Yeah. So they were um, less finicky, um, but they we got it to the stage at the start of practice week, especially, and last time I rode it on a short circuit, just like perfect fueling. It was like riding a modern bike, and we've never had that before. It's yeah. always been, you know, one day it'll be pretty good, and then other days it's horrendous. And yeah. then, um, so I get the feeling dyno time is maybe a little bit of a waste of time in the UK. You've got to get it here and, and run it on the air that it's racing. Yeah, on. kind of. Set and it up where you are. Yeah, and it's, it's not so much the, so the dyno time is, is really valuable for getting the fueling right on the main jet yeah. when you're wide open, but it's always been throttle pickup that these are really sensitive to. Right. So they hate like a, a, part, a constant part throttle. They don't run well at all. It's like a ba 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 yeah, stutter. Yeah. So you either, you, they, they ride better off throttle or progressively uh, applying the throttle. And as you pick the throttle up, it's dependent on the needle on the, on the carb. And that's what they're really sensitive to. And when you're trying to go as fast as you can through a corner like the left before Kirk Michael, you can, you just want to know that when you touch the throttle, it's gonna, it's gonna pick up in a predictable Clean. way. Yeah. yeah. Whereas you know, if you're on the edge of the tire and you try and feed the throttle on, it stutters and then yeah. goes again. Yeah. That's just not confidence inspiring, and, and you want it to be the same every time. Um, even if it was bad every time, it'd be better than different, different. every yeah. time. Yeah. 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 So let's move to this. Are we are we going to finish on rotary stuff, or should we move to the middle part of the bike and talk about shock and swing arm? And then come back to the engine. Yeah, we could probably do, talk yeah. about that bit for hours. Yeah, we? yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, why don't you talk me through this setup? Yeah, well, we've got, we've got a bit of history from the guys who worked at Spondon in the day. Um, so we think that these frames were commissioned by Tony, who had the bikes in the 90s to be built, and this 
swing arm setup is uh, dimensionally is a, is a match for the original bike. So you've got a, a fairly sort of standard box section um, on the left side and then you've got that nice cutaway shape on the right hand side which is to get the exhaust tucked in. Yeah. Um, so they've made that banana swing arm on that side. Um, and then it's got um, uh, like a rocker arm match the shock mounts to the frame and to a rocker arm on the swing arm and then you've got various uh, you've got ride height adjustability yeah. and that was the thing that we started racing this round here in 2014 and didn't have a um, didn't have a clue really what we were, what I, what I didn't no have data. Clue what was, no yeah so like for example going back to the front like the the forks uh, so the yokes are adjustable offset and it turns out that when you buy those yokes they come with the offset spaces already fitted so when we bought the bikes, they had them in, and um, we just thought that's how it was meant to be, rather than they just come as, so you don't lose the spaces, yep. they just keep them um, fitted into the into the yokes. So it took until someone pointed out that we had a massive offset and realised that we just needed to take <laughs> spaces out. Um, so you're making huge changes there. And then got this idea in my head that it was very sensitive to what tyre you use, because it got this horrendous weave. Um, so we put some What's Dunlop tyres. that a race tech in there? Or yeah, Metzler's on at the minute. Yeah. Uh, which is what I use at TT. Yeah. Um, but we had, we put some Dunlops in and it cured the handling. I got to St. Ninian's and was like, it's fixed. And all it was was the tyre was a physically different size. So yeah. we changed the ride height and put these tyres back in and it's been perfect. But yeah. it used to have this terrifying weave, um, just like you'd hit a bump and it would just not stop Never shaking. Never No. And it was just, yeah. When I look back on how little I'd done riding around here, and how bad the bike was handling. There's no way I would be willing to ride that setup of bike round the course as quick as I did when I was like 24 because yeah. uh, it was terrifying. <laughs> what about the exhaust? Massive. Yeah. It's ginormous. Yeah, that's why they're so loud. So that um, Venturi nozzle that sits yep. just in here on the exhaust. As the exhaust gas comes through, it creates a little vacuum, which again is what starts that whole process of drawing air through the engine. So the reason they are loud is functional yep. rather than anything, because if you try and silence them and slow the gas speed down, it chokes they the engine work. up and it doesn't cool as well. Yeah. So, yeah. so there is a reason for it. And um, yeah, the byproduct by is it just sounds ace. <laughs> And what about all that um, smoke that I see when it's going off the line, like a two-stroke? That's, yeah. Uh, do you run <clears throat> premix? How do you lubricate that motor? That's the obvious <clears throat> question. Yeah, so you run premix in the fuel. Yeah. Um, and then there is, so <laughs> again, over the years, we've used more and more oil. So up until the problems we've had this week, Chris, has, Chris Ambler's made these oil tanks that sit here and here. And then there's another one in the frame. And they uh, go into an oil pump here, which runs off the clutch and then that feeds to the the main bearings um, in the in the engine so that gets mixed in with that air that gets sucked through yep. the exhaust and you get air hot air from the engine and oil mixed together that fires out the back of the pipe so uh, yeah i think like yesterday when i was out on it the two minute board had to be shoved over the end of the exhaust so that the rider behind us didn't get completely covered in oil because <laughs> it just fires it out of the back so let's cut i'll ask the simple stuff, so it weighs, ready to race on the start line, how much do you reckon it weighs? Um, the tank of fuel, 150? Yeah, about 150, yeah. And yeah. at the wheel it makes how much horsepower? 130-ish. How many revs do you reckon that 130? Um, probably peak powers, like just under 10,000, but they'll rev to 10 and a half, but yeah. I just tend to short shift it a bit, just to give it an easier time. So covered power, covered weight, how fast will it go, mister? That typical question. Uh, depends how fast you're willing to ride through Corey Benz. Um, I'll, yeah, I've seen 100 and, well, 167 this week um, with a decent toe. Yeah. Um, I think Josh, when he rode it in 2017 and 18, I think he did about 170, 172. Something. What about lap times? Um, so my best from last time we raced here was 118. Um, and the, the big aim that we had that we had with Josh was to try and beat Steve Hislop's time from yeah. 92, which is 123. And I think we, was... we should quickly reference that that 92 Hizzy bike yeah. and the fact that you're running a replica, replica leathers, replica helmet, yeah. and kind of white charger replica bodywork. Yeah. yeah. How beat close did Josh get to Hizzy's lap? Seconds, I think it was like really? something of a second. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the bikes weren't running 
nearly as well as they are now, you know. So he he kind of he dragged it around at that yeah. speed. Yeah, it's probably a faster track now as yeah, well. I guess tyres are better and everything. Yeah. But someone of his level getting, I mean, the bike was obviously not as good as what Steve rode in '92. Yeah. But there are various improvements. It's, it just shows how fast he was. was doing that in the day. That's yeah. incredible, isn't it? Because yeah, a, yeah. a rider of Josh's level getting close to it with all the advantages he've had versus all the you know disadvantages of the bike not being yeah. as quick as Steve's. Um, yeah, I, I think that era of TT racing is just unbelievable and it, it's, there's never been better, I don't think, you know, that level of between him and Fogarty. In 92? It's just, yeah, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? How, that's, how... A, that's a chat for a couple of pints at the pub, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, you definitely use that as a starting point. Steve Hislop and it's history. A win for Hislop and a win for Norton. So one thing that I'm doing in all of these tech pieces is asking teams or, or bike owners if they can put a price, a realistic price on the bike. So if I came to you as a customer yeah. and I and I wanted your dad to build me one of these, yeah. what kind of what kind of bank transfer is going on? To build, I don't know. I mean, obviously like th that's one of the frequent questions of can you get bits for them and, and you can and the bits you can't, you can have made, you yeah. know, if you if you if you wanted to. Brian Crichton's building the um, 700, uh, 700, 700 thing, yeah, um, and that's priced at 85 grand, isn't mm. it? Um, I reckon, yeah, you, you, you probably more or less than that. I'd say about the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if someone wants to come and pay 85 grand for one, I'm sure they'd be up for sale tomorrow. <laughs> um, it's just what they're worth. What people are willing to pay for them, aren't they? Um, and you know, arguably the ones that were factory bikes are probably inherently more valuable mm. because of the history. Um, but to actually, you know, to have the money to be confident that you could you could build another one yourself with that cash, is, yeah, I guess it's about that much. And obviously it's time, isn't it? It's just yeah. back in hours of time that we've spent over the years developing. I think in terms of sound alone, it's absolutely priceless. So I'm uh, more than happy with the homework lesson as we go. I'm sure people at home will enjoy listening to all that stuff as well. Cheers. And uh, yeah, thanks for letting us get in the way. Cheers. Spot on. Cheers.